then hello everyone. I will talk today about the InnoCube from concept to prototype, building the InnoCube with Sapphire. So my name is David. I'm an embedded systems developer at Innovex. I, I'm a Go fan, do embedded Linux, embedded Android, and also work, like to work with microcontrollers. Today, I will talk about how we built the InnoCube. So we will talk about the requirements, which dashboard we selected, how we use Sapphire for the LEDs and the motion sensor, building a small PCB, and the case. So let's start. So the InnoCube is a showcase built with a cross-functional team to show and talk about what we can build. To, so let's see what it should support. We want to have real-time data transmissions, live updates of the orientation. So you can already see the finished product. So, <laughs> And we want to have alerting, for example, when the temperature is exceeding, or, and we want to have it as edge device without Wi-Fi connections, so it's more like an industrial setting or with, with something you can take somewhere when there is no Wi-Fi and you can still do a demo with it. And Data analytics in, in the cloud, for example, if you if you saw it, the flight path, checking checking this, and we want to have a nice dashboard. So here in the short overview of the of the dashboard, you can see the orientation and the temperature and how high you use through the cube. But I won't talk about any of this. I will talk about the embedded part. So the requirements for the InnoCube based on what was wished there was we want to have connectivity, so Bluetooth with the phone, that's nice. We want we need some peripherals for motion tracking and a high resolution temperature sensor so we can check if you put your hand here, get the temperature of your hand and it's also that the values are updating fast. Battery operated and long running because no one likes to charge things. So and the uh, sample rate, which is around every 10 milliseconds, so you have a smooth transact, so you have a smooth view in the web view when you turn it, that you can see it. And the device size should be small, fit in your hand, not, not too big, and should cost around 50 euros. So for this, it's always when you when you when you build something, it's good when you select a dev board which has lots of the sensors you are using. So you don't have to add too much stuff to it to, to achieve what you're doing. So we were looking and we decided for the Nordic Thingy 52 because it has Bluetooth low energy, motion tracking already integrated, it has a battery and pin headers where you can connect your own stuff. And it has an open source firmware where you can look into it how already someone built something. And costs, I think, 38 euros at that point. So there's a small picture of the PCB. There are way more sensors than we are using. We are just using the LED and the motion sensor at the moment, but there are more, more on it. So to, to support our use case, because we want to have the temperature sensor on the outside, we need an external temperature sensor that we select the Atmel one because of its higher resolution. And we want to have a status LED on the, also on the front in the ear of the Innovex, and there we pick a new pixel LED. With this, let's let's talk about a little bit of the firmware, how we how we connected the LEDs, and there when you connect new hardware and we want to use this, it's always nice to go to the. Sapphire repository and check out the samples. So looking LED stripe and it's supporting the NeoPixel LEDs. So nice, we can use this. We can look how it's done there. So let's have a quick look at the source code. It's not important that you understand what everything is happening here. Just a few notes in line 42. The, we, get the date, we get the device from the device tree. I think later in some presentations, Maybe someone will tell more about the device tree, but this is basically where you define how the device should be accessed from the firmware. And we will do a check here if the device is ready. And then later in line 63, the LED strip update RGB command is where the LED color is set. 
So that's that's the example code. So we can take some parts of it. And we also have the internal LED in the thingy. So in the thingy, it's not um, the LED is connected over the over a port extender, the SX1509B. So it's a little bit more code or driver you would need. But luckily, there's also an example. It looks similar. And here, it's in line 74. The device tree is fetched a little bit different. But this is also nice. You can, in the samples, you get to learn different things, how, how you can do stuff. It's a different way, but it's doing the same. We also check if the device is ready, and we have a different function for configuring the intensity or setting the color of the LED. So we, when our code, we take both of the examples and combine them for controlling both LEDs at the same time. So then to the, I think, more interesting part, the motion sensor. The motion sensor in this thingy is an MPU 9250, and it is a nine-axis sensor, so it's a sensor with three sensors in it, a three-axis gyroscope, recording how, how fast you turn it in each direction in X, Y, and Z, and an accelerometer for the acceleration along the three axes, and a compass sensor, or which measures the magnetic field also in all three dimensions. With this, we cannot get to this picture here, so it's not turning, because you only get values as long as you're moving it. So you need a um, sensor fusion algorithm, which takes the values over time and calculates the, the position of the, of, the, of the cube. For this, we, we looked online. There's an open source implementation of the Matrix algorithm. We, we used this, integrated this in our project. The hardest thing was the calibration and parameter tuning. We had drifting, and this was, was a little bit hard to do. And also, we added a feature so you can put the cube in the in predefined direction and recenter it so it's with the web UI, because it depends on how you, when you start the cube, it takes this as the root position, so you can recenter it so it matches the position. With this, we get also how, how do we access it. We look if there's some sample code. And for this, there's no direct example for our MPU 9250, but there's an example for the 6050. So let's look how they are using it. We we have a device tree which is similar enough to the thingy. So we take this one. It says it's on the I2C bus. And here the driver is selected in line 9. So, But this is not the device we are using. So we check the source code. We see someone implemented the driver for the MPU 9250. And we can write our device tree based. It's similar. Extend, and we de select here the other driver and then have some additional values we can we can configure there. With this, we, in our code, we have the same device tree. We can get this node, so we can get the driver for this device. And when we look at the sample code of the MPU 6050, it's, it's nice that Sapphire provides the a generic API to access sensor data. So it's not depending on what, what motion sensor you're using. You just call sensor channel get, and you specify the device you want, and that's you want to have the acceleration or the gyroscope data. So we don't, it's, at this point, it's no longer important which, which driver you are using. You will get some values. So we, we use this to read out the data and then put it into the algorithm to, to calculate the position in the room, or not in the room, the, the position from the turning. So. so then we have some part of the firmware I showed you. Let's see the, our first hardware prototype. As always, we just soldered it on. And to make this then a little bit nicer, we draw a schematic in an online tool 
where we put the new pixel LED and the temperature sensor. And with this, we designed the hardware board. You can also see, see here. You can later also look at it and put this into a case. And the case we designed with FreeCut for 3D printing. And yeah, here you can see some pictures. It's, it's nice with 3D printing. You can experiment a bit. It takes a bit long in the in the nicer resolution. It's 10 hours. So there's you can op we can optimize it to, to print it faster. But that was pretty nice. There are also some wooden made cases, but these are these are may take way longer to produce. So then we have the InnoCube finished for the hardware and our lessons learned. Start with the hardware selection and development early. So you can provide your the developers for the firmware and also the ones writing the mobile application for the thingy or the algorithms for the for the how how high you threw it. So they get hardware where they can test with. It was nice to have a joint hackathon with the first prototype. So we had the hardware first, we did it, and then had a hackathon, I think six, seven people together. And that was nice sitting together and getting, accessing the data and seeing, okay, you get this Bluetooth properties, you have to call these functions, and then you get your data in this format. From Sapphire, the example code is, it's nice, a lot of the drivers are already there, so you can, can use them. And it's a great way to learn how, how, this, how it's implemented. Many features are already there. And I think it's a steep learning curve to, to get into it, but the documentation is also good. So it was fun to build it. Any questions? We started with, I did some upgrades, I remember, from 2.8, could this be? It's like one, one half years ago. 2.7, so yeah, yeah. It's running on, on latest? Mm, not yet, I have everything compiling, but <laughs> <laughs> we'll be there, yeah. For me, it was a little bit hard at first, like to know what what I need to change. But I looked at like where we took the example code from from other stuff. So I searched the commits where it was changed, and then did similar things to to, to my code. That was the migration way. Yeah. Uh, the data is output by Bluetooth, and it's, uh, but it doesn't have any internet connection. Yeah, it has Bluetooth connection. We also have a mobile app which connects over Bluetooth and then sends it to our WebSocket to the cloud backend where the calculation is done and the, and the front end is also connected over WebSocket. But it's a specialized app. It's an, yeah, it's a specialized app which does the, also the auto authentication with, with single sign-on, so you have the user mapping already done. Yeah. So there's no server involved? Um, there's no server involved. The app talks to the server and the mobile, and the, so the app talks to the server and the website also talks to the server with WebSockets. Yeah. Or over WebSockets. The website is in React yeah. and the mobile app is in React Native. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And both looks nice because we had one designer on the team who did all the drawings. So, and I was not designing the UI, so it also looks nice. No text boxes and stuff. <laughs> 
how do you say, I don't know, I'm like that, I'm converting you to IoT uh, area and all. I guess also some, uh, how do you say, something that's um, like for, for tinkering, like something that's easy to use, something like that. I mean, like what kind of server did you use? Or? Um, for the server, we used Go with, with WebSocket. That's also live. For WebSocket, there are finished libraries you, you can use and we made it's a small service because it's you connect to it you you send the data it's just some bookkeeping which devices are connected and which front ends are connected and forwards the data so this so would you say like if you want to become a full stack IoT engineer you need to know something from Sapphire till all the way to making small react apps or something like that for on full stack yes but yeah. i <laughs> i stop really after the before the front end part, I stop. <laughs> yeah. I know I had in my description that I will talk about firmware updates, but 15 minutes was too short. So, but you in there's the MCU manager which does firmware updates. You can look at the examples, and that's basically what we are also using. So, so it's over over Bluetooth we can do other updates. The hardest part was increasing our partition size in there. So it's still, because we needed more space, so we needed to extend the partition a little bit and then we had to change some stuff. This, but otherwise the updates worked pretty nice. Dan, thank you.